I'm Mark Boris and this is Straight Talk. I feel quite nervous. I've had porn stars, prime ministers, but this is the most nervous I've ever felt. Well, you've impressed me so far, as long as you don't fire me. Tackle five, this is the last. He hits it, he's got it. He's got the field goal. Fourth in front and look at the record. Toyne, Toyne. That's not a try, that's a miracle. I just wanted to be a sports commentator. I always wanted to live this dream that I had. When did you realize that you had your voice? To keep it simple, I think a good commentator, he nails the, the high spots by listening to his crowd. Andrew John, inside for Albert. Albert will score! Albert will score! Newcastle and one! We've heard the last call from the legendary Ray Warren. How does it feel to be retired and not be at the forefront of the thing you loved? You've done 99 Origins. People say to me, why don't you do number 100? And I, deep down, I think I could. Do you think Sneezeby's going to give you a call and say, listen, we're going to need you back for call one more? Stop it. (laughs) It's killing me. Ray Warren Rabs. Welcome to Straight Talk, mate. Thank you, Mark. It's a pleasure. I feel quite nervous and I've and I have in your seat I've had murderers porn stars you know globally recognized porn stars like prime ministers premiers but this is the most nervous I've ever felt talking really? to you yeah because I know one thing about I mean I've always looked up to you for a start but I know one thing that Ray Warren admires and that's a good interviewer and here I am interviewing a person who admires good interviewers. And that makes me a little bit nervous. Normally I'm just hanging out to have a conversation, just chilling. And um, and I know we can talk footy and we can talk Olympics, we can talk all those things about Kerry Pack and Channel 9 and all that sort of stuff. But I want to do a fucking good job here. And I want, I want Ray Warren to be impressed when he walks out of the room. So here I go. I'm going to start off like this. Well, you've impressed me so far. Thank you. As long as you don't fire me. I won't fire you, mate. Yeah. There's no way in the world. I started as an apprentice fitter and turner. And Where? Juni, in the Roundhouse, the locomotive Roundhouse, biggest in the Southern Hemisphere. How old were you when you started off as an Fourteen and a half. Yeah, because that was the legal age to start work in those days. Yeah, well, I came out of third year. I was the youngest in the class and I was 14 and five months or something. And if you come from Juni, uh, you're either the son of a, a farmer or you're you got a job in the bank, but most of us worked on the railway, yeah. Or at the abattoir because it was an abattoir. Well, the abattoir probably wasn't as strong as it is now. You know, I, I, I look in the restaurants these days and there's Juni lamb and all the rest of it on the menu. Um, but the roundhouse, uh, that was where most most of my mates, that's where they worked. As I said, if you, if you didn't work on the railway, you were – you know, you're on the land. It's a very rich area down there, fertile, beautiful stuff, yeah. And did you have aspirations to be anything other than a fit and a turner? Oh, mate, I I got mesmerised um, and idolised a, a great race caller, the best of his time, Ken Howard, uh, when I was as early as six, six and seven, and I just wanted to be a sports commentator. I didn't want to wear the baggy green. I didn't want to wear the kangaroos jumper. I didn't need to caddy for Kel Nagel or Peter Thompson. I just wanted to be a sports commentator. Since I was about nine, um, Fitter and Turner didn't cross my mind. And then after that, I joined the police force. And the only reason that crossed my mind is because uh, I was following my brother's footsteps. But I... I always wanted to absolutely live this dream that I had as a, a kid about six or seven, yeah. I guess we've got to take people right back because, by the way, you are 80 years of age. You were 80 years of age in June. So if we could take people back, you know, 70 years, most people listening wouldn't even know what that means. In the household, there's no television, maybe no TV, maybe there is, maybe there isn't, but there's definitely a radio. And absolutely. The, and the yeah. radio's going all the time. Yeah, look, let me tell you about the the home that I was raised in, in Juni. Um, It was a humble little weatherboard cottage. We had white ants. We had an ice chest. We didn't have a refrigerator. 
We had a fuel stove because we didn't have any hot water. A copper. We had, we had a copper. You're absolutely right. Where mum would do the washing and uh, she'd wring it out by hand. The washing. They had a ringer. That was called a ringer. Well, the the, the, the ringer was still to come actually because she was a strong woman. But when the hands became ath- arthritic, we uh, we invested in a ringer. The clothes uh, line was um, held up by a, the branch of a tree. And the outside dunny, it came fitted with redback spiders. So that, that's where I come from. So there's, there were no silver spoons, absolutely no. Uh, there was, was no uh, silver spoons in our lifetime that I remember. And two of the greatest parents you could ever have. Dad, Dad was a fettler on the railway. Not many people would know what a fettler was. And then he, he thought he got promoted to become a labourer. And I thought that was quite funny, a promotion from Fettler, pick and shovel, uh, to become a labourer. Mum raised seven kids. I'm the youngest of them. Um, And um, she used to clean the courthouse, clean the Commonwealth Bank, and then she turned uh, a hand to catering for the occasional wedding. So it it, it was an amazing upbringing. You sound very proud to be able to say that about your parents. I'm very proud. Actually, six of the kids were raised out at a level crossing, a little place called Brushwood, and it's somewhere down towards Coolerman and Gan Main, and Dad was the fettler, and on a, on a manual trike he would run the length, they called it running the length, to check the railway gauge that it hadn't buckled in the heat or contracted in the cold, and uh, Mum was very proud. She was in charge of the Weybridge at the silo. So uh, when they come in with their horse and cart or truck full of wheat or, or oats, uh, she would dash over from this humble little cottage, three bedrooms, six kids and her and Dad. How they slept, I'm not sure, maybe head to toe. And she would weigh the wheat and the oats and all that. And she was the first woman and possibly the only woman in the history of the railway, and she was so proud of this, to have a Weybridge man's licence. And then the whole family, the whole family used to be in charge of opening the level crossing gates uh, to let the occasional farmer or grazier cross the railway line. And those stories... You've always been good at stories. I mean, those stories sort of sit, you know, at 80 years of age, still firmly in your mind and in your memory. And I can just see the glee, the happiness in your face yeah. when you talk about it. Because, look, bottom line is, you know, like going outside of your territory where you currently live, you're not, you, you, that's, yeah. that's your go. Um, and you're not, com- you're not that comfortable you know, you're comfortable now, but you're not that comfortable. You don't want to do – you don't need to do this sort of stuff in your life. I mean, you've done all this sort of stuff a million times over. You didn't have to come here. but the, And I saw when you come in here, a little, not a little nervous, a little what's going to happen. But then as soon as you start talking about that, amazing, like how your whole demeanour changed. And you just started talking about your parents, like you went into another place. Yeah. Well, they, um, they provided the seven kids with um, food – clothing, roof over their head. We never wanted for anything, really. Um, and they did that off a pittance, really. I mean, <laughs> the wages they would have been bringing home would have been ridiculously low. So, you know, I I owe them big time and I, I tell them every time I go down there to the cemetery, um, but... Sometimes you don't tell them to their face. You leave it too late, don't you, sometimes? It happens to all of us. Yeah, I know, I know, yeah. I mean, it's, 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 it's funny when you were saying those things, you know, about the dunny outside and uh, the old copper. The reason I said those things is I remember them. I had them as a kid too. Well, their mum had a ringer <laughs> to, to, dry, to, to take <laughs> so the water you, out. You, you, you've well, always had more money than yeah, me. We had a ringer, yeah. <laughs> but it, it's, it's, for me... I know Ray Warren, like he's, he's famous in Australia and particularly in these states when it comes to rugby league and the Olympics and, you know, everything else that you've achieved, particularly in the media, both radio, television. You're a big personality, but what your seems to me to be one of the greatest attributes of yourself is your memory of what you just said about your parents. And I think my little bit of exposure to you over the years is you've carried that frugalness through to your own life, right? 
to now. You're not a big spender. You're quite careful as a person. How much is who you are today in relation to what you worked hard for to accumulate? How much of that can harken back to the way you saw your life as a kid and how your parents were quite frugal? Not They didn't overspend. They never did anything silly. They were very careful with their money because they had to be. Mm. How much of that do you think carries forward into your 80th year? I think a fair bit of it, you know. Um, my wife, um, God love her, she's still complaining that we haven't updated our car from 2007, um, mainly because I'm a bit pig-headed. I think the car is going fantastic and I wouldn't get much as a trade-in anyway. Um, I think that's the question that you're asking yeah. me. Yeah, that, that's transferred to me. Um, I don't mind having a gamble on the horses but – I, I'd be very disappointed if somebody charged me a dollar fifty and I could get it for a dollar next door. Um, I probably didn't want to admit that, but it's true. Uh, but you know, I, 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 I don't know, Mark. Uh, all I know is that uh, they looked after me big time. Um, they probably spoiled me. Actually, um, I never, I never wanted a new tennis racket or a new cricket bat, but they showered me with that but keep in mind the brother elder the 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 child just above me was my brother and he was six years six years older than me bob um and uh i think i might have been a mistake actually when i when i work it out what a mistake though was a great mistake they gave me (laughs) they gave me a chance to breathe they gave me a chance to live a dream and um I think I did, yeah. Let's just talk about that dream. I mean, which, you know, you're in, you got lots of people inspired you, but you wanted to be a caller. Like you wanted to call things on radio in yeah. sport, in sport. Yeah. When was your first crack at that? Oh, well, Mark, I, I don't want to bore you, but I... I'm not bored, mate. I started, I started rolling marbles down a slope. When I was under the spell of this man called Ken Howard, who I aspired to be. Uh, there's no question about that. I uh, had a marble tin. Most kids my age had a tin full of marbles and I I was able to work out how he was calling the horses. Uh, it's, it's done by a process of identification of the colours on the jockey. I, I was able to work that out even though I was still at primary school. But getting back to the marbles, I sorted out the marbles that were all different colours and I gave them horse names like Farlap and Carbine and and uh, Delta and Comic Court and God knows who. And uh, there was one special one called Playboy, which my dad let me have a bet on as a maiden in the 49 Derby. He let me have sixpence on 1949. it. 1949. 1949. That's when it all started. Uh, he was babysitting me and I was driving him mad because I had chicken pox and I was scratching and squealing and whinging. And to shut me up, he let me have sixpence on my favourite jockey, George Moore, on a horse called um, Playboy, trained by Tom Smith. Um, and it won at 20 to 1. And uh, he, Dad then owed me 10 shillings. And he said, well, you can have sixpence on every Saturday until you go broke. There was no way he was going to give me the 10 shillings, but he, he, uh, he, he said you can have sixpence on a horse of your choice um, every Saturday. Because that was the only time we got, it was the only time we got the races. On this big radio, you, you touched on some of the things in that home of mine. We only ever lived in the kitchen. We didn't live in the lounge room. We only entertained guests there, people that, I won't call them enemies, but um, they must have been important if they were being entertained in the lounge room. Our hub, the control centre, was the kitchen with the fuel stove, no hot water, always water boiling on the fuel stove Um, and this radio, His Master's Voice or Stromberg Carlson, uh, as big as a garbage bin, the ice chest over there in that corner and mum and dad, the SP bookmaker, the illegal bookmaker would come around and take their bets every Saturday. He'd come back on the Sunday and tell them how much they lost or how much they won. It was... uh, it was ingrained into me and the radio is blaring 
this man from uh, the racetrack, Ken Howard. I'm riding a broom around the kitchen table and I'm pretending to be Ken Howard and George Moore all at the same time. The famous jockey. Famous jockey. I forgot to tell you that, yeah. Yeah. So I'm not quite sure where... I went to just then, but... I, no, you, but there's a romance attached to that. Yeah, I, I digress from the question. That's what I'm trying to say. But there, it, but it was is a romantic scene. I don't mean... It, uh, <laughs> I'm not trying to do a, a lovey-dovey thing, but a romantic scene in a sense of it has a romance attached to it. Because it's funny, as you were talking there, I just remember my late mother, we always had a radio going, we didn't have a TV, and my mother always had the radio going like nearly 24 hours a day and, and my memory was the ki- everything was around the kitchen, as you say, but I always remember my mum singing songs um, and uh, there was a show that used to come on at 8 a.m. every morning called Sammy Sparrow. Oh, yeah, Gary O'Callaghan. Gary O'Callaghan. Sammy Sparrow. Correct. And yeah. I knew when Gary O'Callaghan said, Sammy Sparrow, <laughs> that was my time to go to the bus stop. Yes. It was 10 past 8 in the morning. Yes. And it's funny, I got to meet Gary O'Callaghan. Um, he's Lovely man. Away, but I met him about... I met him over a number of years. He and I were member, members members of this club called the Darlow Desperates and twice yeah. a year we used to meet and um, it was a lot of old coppers and what have you we used to meet. And unfortunately, Gary got quite ill a few years ago and passed away but he was a good dude. And um, But I remember that show and I remember that scene and I have a romance attached to it in my mind similarly to the way I think you have the same romance attached mm-hmm. in your mind I didn't want to become Gary O'Callaghan, but you you turned it into something. What is the process? What was the process of turning it into Ray Warren, say, becoming the Channel 10 caller of rugby league or, or even the races prior to that? How did that happen? Like where was your first good break? Well, I, I, I can remember I was in the police force at Canberra and I was uh, sitting on top of the grandstand roof uh, with no tripod, you you need a tripod for your binoculars to try and call races. Um, that's what I was. I, I'd take my uniform off and I'd, I'd go straight to the racetrack to pr- practice calling races. And then one day somebody said, "Do you think you could call the a trotting Jim Carner?" And I said, I, "I think I can. I think I'm ready for that." You know, but you've got to understand, I'd I'd basically hawked my way around Sydney radio stations um, with a tape um, of calling the marbles, really. Um, the dibs. Did you call them dibs? Dibs, yeah, yeah. 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 The bocchies. Yeah, yeah. And <laughs> we used to be playing dibs at school yeah, too. Yeah, that's right. Big ring and all that sort of stuff. Yeah, stop it. <laughs> you, <laughs> it's killing you, me. You, you Don't keep, worry. You keep snapping me and, uh, and, and I can't get back to where I started. But... When I was 17, I joined the police cadets in Sydney and um, I had this dream that that was, if you like, injected into me back when I was six, back in Playboy and all that sort of thing, riding the broom. And um, I had to to wait in the queue basically and here I am. I, I transfer from the police cadets in Sydney to Canberra and I'm then 23. So 17 years have passed and I get a telegram. Do you remember the telegram? I do. Yeah. And it said, uh, do you still want to be a sports commentator? Because I'd had an interview with a, a man at 2GB called Garth Carey. And he said, basically, look, look, he said, I don't know why you're trying to sound like Ken Howard. He said, because that's what we don't want. We don't want an imitation Ken Howard. So go away, keep working on it. You're doing the right thing. Keep up the marbles, do all you all you want to do, and you never know. He said, we own five radio stations in New South Wales alone. So at 23 years of age, the telegram arrives from 2LF Young and he said, uh, do you still want to do it? I said, absolutely, absolutely. When do I start? He said, I needed you yesterday. He said, but he said, can you be here next weekend? I said, I'll, I'll make it for sure. And um, I then sought, I sought to leave the police force because I had a contract. Uh, I said to the superintendent, I've got to do this, you know. And he said, I, I know. He said, uh, word gets around. And he said, really, I don't think you were cut out to be a pl- policeman anyway. He said, we put you on point duty and you created a four-car head-on collision. 
He said, you don't like the sight of blood, so we couldn't send you to an accident. He said, I asked you to lock up a couple of SP bookmakers and you said, do I have to? I owe them both 20 quid. Uh, so he summarised my ability as a policeman pretty quickly, but I went to 2LF Young in 1966 and I was there three years before somebody back at 2GB, probably Garth Carey, um, needed another understudy to Ken Howard. So you see what's happened, that, that dream, that aspiration to become Ken Howard. Now I'm not his understudy but I'm his number two understudy and working next to the great man. John Tapp was Johnny Tapp. next in line to the throne and I was like Prince William, if you know what I mean. Um, so that, that's how it evolved, okay, and I, I was – calling provincial racing and God knows what I wasn't doing, uh, dogs, trots, you name it. Then the football commentator got sick and I stepped in to, uh, to do that and I finished up the football caller, come race caller at 2GB, which led me to the Amco Cup in 74. Can I ask you this, Ray, like when did you realise that you had your voice? I mean, the, the, the Ray Warren voice. Have you produced the voice or did you always have this voice? No, I, I, I touched on that when Garth Carey said to me, why are you trying to sound like Ken Howard? And I said, because I thought he was the best and it was good to sound like the best. But he said, no, 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 no. He said, we don't want an imitation. So I went to a fellow called Bryson Taylor and he, he taught you how to be a DJ and he taught you how to speak, I suppose, um, and he took away a fair bit of the Ken Howard for me. Um, mind you, it wasn't easy because uh, I, I, could, I could imitate Ken Howard now probably with a great deal of ease, but um, I, I don't want to go back there and have Garth Carey Telling me, uh, I don't want you sounding like that. But, it, but so, but because your voice is sort of quite polished. I mean, I think it is anyway. It sounds quite polished. It doesn't sound like the bloke who had the dunny out the back, the red back spiders, and you know, uh, the dad getting on the on the uh, get on the railway and pushing himself along to test things out. And your mum out there and young trying to you know, be a cleaner and all those other things that you're doing the way bridge, etc. It sounds like a kid who's been to uh, Cranbrook you know, alongside James Packer or something like that. Because it's very, your voice is very polished. It is very polished. And I was just trying to – I've always tried to work it out. Is Ray – has Ray produced his, his voice? And uh, cause, and it's a specific sound. I mean, you, f you say you don't like you, – you were told not to imitate someone else's voice. There are so many people – I've heard it, people try to imitate your voice. Oh, yeah. yeah I understand so good. that. Yeah, Mark, I, 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 I said to your EP, Jessica, you know, I – I I haven't been recognisable walking the streets, you know, I, I suppose I am now, but um, I I get recognised by my voice. Uh, you know, a, a woman came over the other day in the bowling club and she said, you Ray Warren? I said, yeah, I am. She said, I recognise the voice. And I, I said to Jessica, I was in television for over 50 years, but I very seldom was on television. Um, and that's a good thing because I didn't need makeup and I've got a good head for radio. <laughs> I know that. But no, I, I'm, I'm, I won't say I'm proud of my voice. I'm, I'm lucky to have the voice I've got and I'm flattered by people imitating me. Uh, once upon a time I hated it. But then I became flattered and it probably was initiated mainly by Billy Birmingham. Uh, he had a big part in the imitation thing, yep. but I eventually what happened with, with Billy highlighting it, uh, every Tom, Dick and Harry wanted to do, wanted to do a rabs, you know. I don't know if you Young really Mark, he, he's... Uh, young Mark Warren. Young Mark Warren, he's, <laughs> what is he, 53, 54 and Holding he, he, does, he does a really good rabs. Uh, I had a larrikin from Balmain, Ronnie Ryan, he rang me the other day and uh, he give me a, a, qu a quick rabs at about two o'clock in the morning. <laughs> There's a lot of people out there doing rabs and, as I said, I'm flattered now but I was cranky early on. 
I don't know if you realise, but it does have a beautiful timbre about it. There, there is in just the way your voice sounds. It's, it's, it, it has an attraction, and that works because people like to listen to your voice. By the way, it's not just the timbre of it; it's your turn of phrase. I mean, I have seen state of origin games where you come up at the last moment with a not funny but memorable turns of phrase in, in relation to players what they might have just done in terms of how they scored a try you know that's not a try it's a miracle yeah i mean those turns of phrase um, do you remember or better a better question do you think about this before you go into the game before you're going to call no, it? No, i'm just going to no, use I, that or that's just off the cuff i mate, mate it's off the cuff i swear blind you know i if ever I've um, rehearsed anything, it probably came in my swimming career as a commentator. Uh, you knew you knew Ian Thorpe was going to win. You knew Liesl Jones was going to win. You knew Grant Hackett was going to win. But it started to actually, it started to become monotonous, trying to think of something different to say. Because you know those historical pieces they keep in the newsroom and and they expect the play-by-play commentator to take command of the situation over the last 20 metres. In the, in the pool? Absolutely, yeah. And um, I, I think once or twice I thought, what different can I say about the bloke in the big black suit, you know? What more can I say about Hackett? Um, and I probably thought about new lines to use then, but... That's not a try, that's a miracle. Uh, that was spontaneous. Um, Talus, 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 look at Talus. Rag dolling this Brett Hodson fellow, you know. Spontaneous. Um, oh, there's a couple of other ones I can't remember. And, and in terms of nicknames, like Madam, I think Madam Butterfly. Madam Butterfly was Susie, yeah. Yep. Uh, so yeah. Were, they, were, that, were, were they your thoughts? I mean, did you say, I'm just going to call her Madam Butterfly, or was that just spontaneous? Well, it... it it feels spontaneous to me, but I'm I'm sure there's been somebody before me that talked about Madame Butterfly. But I thought here she is swimming the two hundred or the hundred fly, and uh, she's a lovely thing. And I, I just thought well, maybe I'll I'll drop it in for fun, you know. Madame Butterfly has done it again, you know. How much? Come on, Susie, come on, you know. All how, that stuff. How much? How much of the calling a horse race and and calling a human racing and also calling a football game too, how much commonality is there? Oh, well, I think I think you mean common denominator? Yeah. Like, yeah well, you've got to be able to recognise for a start, you know. It's no use thinking you're going to call the Melbourne Cup and I called three Melbourne Cups. Uh, it's no use thinking you're going to call the Melbourne Cup without a lot of preparation. So you you recognise what horse name to call it because of the colours on the jockey. So Malcolm Johnson's on Kingston Town and you know he's he's got a gold jacket and he's got red red striped sleeves and a, a red cap, Kingston Town, you know. Um, you, you know, Sangster's horse has got a green jacket with uh, blue sleeves and uh, a white cap with green green spots on it. Beldale Ball, uh, who won the 80 Cup, which I called. Um, but those those colours never leave your mind. But it's the same with footballers. Um, you get to know the bloke that's got blonde hair, the bloke that's got red hair. You got you know that the bloke's got strapping uh, around his head um, or on on his knee or whatever. Um, so, so the the commonality is the word you use. Yeah. yeah, it 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 extends to all sports. Probably the one that it doesn't extend to is swimming because they got their head in the water and their bum looking at you. And so, <laughs> it's it's totally different. But the thing about swimming that pe- people probably don't realise is they never change lanes. So you give yourself a little bit of a start there. You. You put one to eight and you put them in their lanes and it's always there, you know, and that's that's probably the, the sport that is the exception. Greyhounds, I did them on television for quite some time and they're a little bit different again because one the red in race one might be Mark Buros, but one the red in race two is is Mark Warren. Are you with me? Yeah. So 
you call the race, but now you've got to get Mark Burros in that red jacket, get, get him out of your head because there's, a, there's another dog in the same box with the same colour uh, and you've got to get him back in you. You're good. He's, he's your fixture now. So long answer, sorry about that, but it no, might but, help. But it, but it actually but it puts it in a perspective. But I also think too that one of the things I'd noticed and, and whenever I've listened to you call things, Melbourne Cup, races generally, rugby league, Olympics, swimming in particular, swimming in the Olympics, there was always the same level of excitement. So Ray was always to, able to bring a level of excitement. It was never fake. It was actually, you were actually excited. Like, you know, um, and you know that um, Ian Thorpe's going to win, as you say, because he was always the favourite. He was always the best in his, his field, generally speaking, I'm talking about. But still, you were able to deliver to someone sitting at home watching on television that level of excitement. And you did that. You did it in the state of origin. You do it at normal football calls, um, which, by the way, I miss. Um, and everybody tries to copy, but they don't get it right. Um, you did it in every in everything in it, as well as the uh, Melbourne Cup. How do you manage to keep that level of excitement, or is Rabs actually really excited about what's going on? No, I, I can answer the, the question uh, quite simply. I I disagree with you in in part. I'm I'm not always excited. It sounds like it to me, though. Yeah, well, no, I think what you what you are saying is I, I had the ability to recognise when to become excited and the answer is simple, listen to the crowd. Right. Listen to the crowd and if they're excited, you can be excited. You can let it all hang out. But if they're, if they're in a slumber, um, you, you can't slumber. You've still got to remain entertaining and that can come through starting an argument with Gus, a little bit of theatre, never hurt, just to get us through the night, you know what I mean? But uh, to keep it simple, uh, I think a good commentator, he, uh, he nails the, the high spots by listening, to his, by listening to his crowd. And I used to go crook out at the stadium there Often I'd say, why do they put fixed windows in broadcasting boxes when I want to hear the crowd, the real crowd, not not this crowd in my ears. I want to hear these people out there. So they, believe it or not, at Acor Stadium, I think it's called Acor now, yep. uh, a little friend of mine, Arthur Stanley, he had the, the carpenter come in, the chippy, and he cut a hole in the under the table. He cut a big hole so that so that Rabs could hear the crowd. Um, and I'm indebted to him for for that. It's it's interesting that you, when you get a um, sort of a a dead spot in the broadcast, so the crowd's really quiet. Was well, not enough people there, especially yeah. a place like Acor. Um, how do you how how and who is the best? I don't want to call it sidekick, but who's the best person who actually would help fill up a blind spot or a soft spot or a quiet spot, like Gus, for example? You said you would might create a bit of an argument with him. How? Who was the best at that with you in, in terms of footy? So who, who do you feel as though was the the best person to have alongside you when it got a bit quiet and a bit oh, – and you had to continue un- Undoubtedly him. Gus. Yeah, absolutely. I mean I, I, I will long cherish the day we, we were in Melbourne um, calling Melbourne versus somebody. It doesn't matter. But Melbourne uh, 44 to nil and there's still – Oh, 20 minutes to go. And the there was a flock of seagulls and they kept flocking to one end of the ground and and he was mesmerised by it. Because he's a bit weird. Gus a bit weird. He, he understands television because the bottom line in television or radio is the E word, entertainment. So if you've got a scoreboard of 44 to nil, what, where are you going to go? And I used to go to the theatre and pull out the Humphrey Bogart, really, Phil Gould, and he, I'd, I'd keep trying to call the match, in other words, retaining some kind of excitement and interest, and he'd keep saying, Rabbits, why are they only feeding at the one end, the seagulls? And I'd say, Gus, please let me try and call on, if you don't mind, you know, Smith, Cronk, um, Inglis, um, Rabbits, th- those seagulls, they're back there again, you know. And he, he, he knew he was, he was getting at me, but I'm, I'm encouraging him by, by ignoring him. 
So you ask me who who do you want next to you when it's 44 to nil? Gus. That doesn't mean that I don't think Sterling and Vorton and all those people aren't brilliant. Um, but if, 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 we're, if we're filling, uh, we're ad-libbing and we're basically cheating and we want some theatrics, then it's him, yeah. I, I, I'm going to – hopefully you're going to be happy with this but I, and I'm going to put you in a spot to – because I've always wanted to know f- from someone like you. Because I learned this from Kerry. Kerry used to do this with Ronnie Coot and Arthur back in the day when I used to sit with Kerry with footballers and Kerry would always say, well, you know, who was the toughest guy you ever tackled or who was the fastest bloke on the field? Who didn't you want to tackle? Whatever. And I always thought that's a good way of learning stuff from experts. So, Rabs, in rugby league, let's go to origin because it's, it's contemporary at the moment. It's an issue. Who do you think was the best coach that New South Wales ever had? Who's the best coach New South Wales You've ever had? Ever had? You know, in the since eighty two. Oh gee, and you and you're, you you've been calling Origin. You've done ninety nine Origins. You started calling Origin what ninety? No, I, I called my first Origin in eighty nine. Yeah, eighty nine. Right. Um, so you've and covered I called, most and of them. I called ninety nine of them, and you. You're probably going to ask me the question later on, why Why did you pull up at 99? But uh, it's, a t- it's a tough question because uh, I see Craig Bellamy and Wayne Bennett. Uh, New South Wales, though. I want to start with New South okay, Wales. Okay, well, I think time will tell me that the best coach was Craig Bellamy, but uh, he didn't have any success. Yeah. Uh, as far as as far as the record books um, show, I mean, I think Brad Fittler is about fifty out of a hundred. He's he's he's, he's yeah. almost got a pass mark, yeah. Brad. Yeah, and I don't know whether Craig got a pass mark like that, but no, he didn't because Be- Bellyache was. Uh, I think he only did it for two years or something like that. No, you're right. He he, he did it for a couple of years, but it doesn't mean he was a failure. No, no, no. It might mean that the other team were better. At the but, time. But you asked me, uh, and with time I'm saying Bellamy, you know, um, I might be wrong. Uh, but then again, the bloke I've just finished talking about, he's the most successful New South Wales coach ever. Yep. Phil Gould. I mean, he, he if he did anything wrong in life, he became immersed and obsessed uh, by, by rugby league. I hated sitting next to him on a plane. He just talked rugby league, rugby league and more rugby league. But now that I think about it, he probably was the best coach. What do you think makes Phil Gould, or at least his record, show that he's the best coach? I mean, look, you're different players in different eras. I get all that. But as a person, your relationship with him, what do you know about this guy that you think made him so good at what he did? I would suggest passion would be one word that that comes to mind. He he would have been dreaming and, and thinking and eating and smelling the event uh, long before the event, and I, I'm sure the same applies to Brad Fittler. But uh, it's a tough gig, though. But I know Gus would be sending texts at two o'clock in the morning. I've never met anybody that uh, that sort of has become immersed as much as Gus in, in rugby league and he's, he's got a wonderful football brain. Uh, don't get me wrong, I, I'm, aware, I'm, I'm aware that he can polarise and, and that's, that's a pretty golden term if you're talking about commercial television or radio. You know, you don't want, you don't want blokes sitting there agreeing with each other all night long, you know. And he'll come out and he'll say that he'll he'll drop one of the most polarizing things you can say, you know. And people think, well, he's arrogant, isn't he? You know, and all those other words. But that's him. That's do, him. Do you think Gus would do those things just to make it more entertaining, just for the just for the intellectual fun of it? Yeah, I do. Yeah, I, 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 I he make. I think he makes people think. I mean, a perfect example. People people still come to me today and say, "What about Gus?" You, do you like him? I said, I, I love him. And the bloke said, I, I 
I can't stand, I can't stand it. They, I turned him off. I said, well, if you turn him off, how come you've just quoted him verbatim? I said, you're quoting him verbatim and you turn him off? How did you turn him off if you weren't listening to him? Phil Gould, to me, is one of the most enigmatic rugby yeah. league people that's ever walked this planet. Yeah. Uh, up there with Jack. Which one have you got? And probably Bennett too, I mean, in some in some respects. Yeah, which um, one have you got? I work with them both. Yeah, you know? and, uh, and you have worked with them both and you've worked with, and or more importantly, you've called players. And I was looking through some old footage, quite old footage of you calling various players. Who would be the most exciting halfback you've ever seen play footy? I know there's going to be lots of them, you know, there's a whole a whole stream of them, but like, who's someone, as soon as I said, that comes out into your mind? Oh, well, Sturlow, he he, he was really, I, I remember one, one game I was calling ground level at a dusty old Cumberland Oval and he was having a picnic, I think, against uh, the Roosters, I'm sorry to tell you, but... And I, again, spontaneously, uh, he scored a try and I said, he's a freak, this kid. This is long before he became a freak. I said, he's a freak, this kid. So he grabbed me real big, you know. Um, and Alfie and, of course, the eighth immortal. Joey. Yeah, they'd be the th- they'd be the three that jump out at me, you know. Who knows? Nathan Cleary might become... One of them, I don't know, but they're the three that jump out at me, yeah. Yeah, and because and, if you don't mind me, I'm just going to quickly go through because I, I, I've always wanted to know this from you because I remember hearing you call in the centres. I mean, is there a special affection for old Pearl, for Pearl when he was, especially when he was playing Origin for Queensland? Steve Renoff? Yeah, is there, there a you. special affection for him? For you, in terms of being watching a player, observing a player, especially when he took off. Well, I, I remember... The 90, 92 and 93 grand final, I've, I've got a feeling he scored either a long-range try in both or scored long-range tries twice in one game. And Birmingham, I mentioned Bill Birmingham yep. earlier, he, uh, he he picked me up. He, he, he was the only one that picked me up. But he got the ball, I think, an intercept on his own 10. And by the time he'd got to the 20, I started with Renouf. By the time he got to the halfway, it was Renoff, and then it was Renouf, and then it was Renoff, and then it was Renouf and Renoff, and Birmingham. He absolutely loved it, you know. I, I think he put it on one of his albums. But uh, Steve was a beautiful player, um, beautiful player. Not much more I can say about him. Okay, but so, but do you think rugby league? Rugby league players. Do you think rugby league produces beauty? I mean, honestly, do, like because racehorsing is they're beautiful things to watch. Swimmers mm. are actually beautiful to watch. Yeah, it's a, it's a bad word, isn't it? But it doesn't matter. We, uh, it, but there is a, a, a physical beauty in it. Like a, it's yeah. a rhythm that uh, it seems to happen. It, it is, yeah. Well, you know, you. I go back uh, and basically, I, I didn't, I didn't see him play, but I. I saw news flashes of him and obviously I, I can watch him back now. There was nothing more graceful than Reg Gasnier no. when he broke through the line and he put that head back. <laughs> you, you teach them to run with their head down but not 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 puff the magic, magic drag and he'd cock it back and away he'd go and score another try. Why is it you never saw that? Because It's because you weren't living in Sydney. No, well, I... I, I didn't start public. calling in Sydney till seventy one, and and I didn't live in Sydney. We didn't, we didn't have a television for a, a long, long time. Let me assure. You. I used to, st- I used to stand outside the elect- electric store that was the only store in Journey that that had a TV, and they'd leave it on at night time, and I'd I'd wander down in the twilight zone and try and call whatever sport might have been available. Um, so, mum and dad, they couldn't afford a TV again because. The food and the roof and the clothing, that was more important than the television. And that we didn't have a car. We, we rode bikes to work and Dad only bought a car, um, a utility, um, when he retired at 65. When he was 65? When he was 65. And him and Mum would get the thermos flask and a couple of sandwiches and uh, an axe 
and they'd go out and they'd chop up some wood and put it in the back of the ute <laughs> and, um, and bring it back for the fuel stove, which brings us back to the kitchen. From where we started. <laughs> yeah. it's, it's, it, I, I, it's funny. My, I was lucky. My dad used to tell me at the sports ground to watch St George um, and uh, particularly if they were playing Canterbury. And we used to go to the sports ground, and I do remember Reg Gazanier in the sixties, and I was only I was only ten in during that period, and uh, I remember Kev, there was a bloke who played for St George in those days, a guy called Kevin Ryan. Um, yeah, and they, he went to Candles. Canterbury and became the nemesis of St George. Correct. Yeah, and yeah. Um, I was living in Punchbowl at the time and went to school at the Kemba, and uh, I remember. Um, my mother and father thought he was just the greatest person of all time. He was a good Catholic boy. My mother's Irish Catholic. Um, he was a, I think he was a barrister or something like he that a, at the time. He was a barrister, yep. yeah. And, uh, and he and was probably one of the toughest forwards ever played the game. Ex-fighter, ex-pro fighter and front row. And and I remember he came to our school and uh, mum and dad were there and uh, I met the guy, Kevin Ryan, and he was the nicest bloke yeah. ever. Well, so was John Sattler. But when they went across the white line... They were different people. In fact, I think Ryan went to Canterbury and became captain, captain coach. Captain coach, yes. Yeah, and, and knocked over St George. Yep, yeah, 100%. Captain yeah. coach. I remember because it was a big thing in our area when it all happened. And uh, he was a giant of a man, like, to look at, mm. um, like, relative to me as a kid, I guess, at the time. But even... He looked like he was built out of granite. Yeah, and that's why yeah. they used to call him uh, cement because he came from Candos. Yeah. The, 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 that's, out in the bush where the famous cement. for cement, is yes, it? Yeah. yeah. And but he played like so. He David was, Gillespie, another one, was cement too. Yeah. Okay. And these guys used to play a certain style of footy, which you wouldn't get away with today, um, and no one would even try it. Footy then was really about hard men. Yeah. Footy today is about hard men, but they're very much more athletic. Well, they're bigger and faster. hundred percent. Do you have a preference for how you would like to watch footy? Because for me, I liked it back then. I actually did like it back then. Maybe it was for me it was much more romantic in my mind, but I liked the style of footy then. Bash and barge. So to give you an example, St George would ruck it out and ruck it out and ruck it out and even Ken Carney would have a run, you know, and... Then when they got down towards the, the red zone at the other end of the ground, they'd give it to the entertainers. Yeah, Billy Smith and Popper Clay and Reg Gaznia to mention, and there was a fellow called Langlands. Then you had a bloke called Lumsden on one wing and King on the other. Um, <laughs> and that was all preceded by it could be up to ten tackles before you got to the entertainer. And I understand what you're saying, and we, I, I think, I think we called it bash and barge football. Yeah. Then they went to four tackle, and it was a complete disaster. Uh, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't hesitate to think we could go to seven now, to be honest with you. But um, six seems to be comfortable, but there's always a bit of kerfuffle when somebody makes it dead, and they get a seven tackle set. The opposition. There's always a little bit of nerves, uh, so I wouldn't I wouldn't resist possibly going out to seven tackles now. But to get to your uh, to get to your question, no, I prefer it now because it's based around bigger, faster, uh, heavier collisions, athleticism, almost artistic, with uh, taking the corner post out. What the wingers are doing today. Just amazes me, and the kickers. So we, we're on different sides of the ledger there. I, I, I used to love. I, I have a romantic view of it, like uh, uh, in terms of like how these guys were like warriors. I, uh, romantic in that I was a kid, and it was always sold to me this way. And uh, I mean, I obviously love footy today. I love it in every way. It is. It doesn't matter how it changed, but I, I have this beautiful memory of how it was back then and I, I, I can never sort of forget it. And they were all gentlemen too. Everybody was a gentleman that, that I ever met. Um, gentlemanly in a gentlemanly sense, like how my mother would define a gentleman. Yeah. Always walk on the outside mark of the woman if you're walking up the street. Make sure – and I used to say, why, Mum? And she said, because if a truck goes by and there's a puddle there, you get splashed before the woman does. That's right. Always open the door of the car. These, these concepts, these philosophies were – 
sort of how the my, in my memory of how the footy players played footy. Um, today it is a lot more about money, of course, and it's a lot more about um, you know, keep in mind they're professional now. Total professional. The, the people they you're then. talking about probably had five schooners on their way home from training. Yeah, and then play the next morning, and that's why I I hesitate to compare different eras. You know, somebody might say to me, you, you, you're big on Slater. And I said, yeah, I know, but to compare him with Clive Churchill, I would never do that because, one, I didn't see Clive Churchill, but so many things have have transpired in the changing of the game. Uh, the grounds are better. The football was an old heavy leather thing. Um, Stitched uh, together. Science, science has improved. Um professionalism is with us. So you can't you can't really compare Bill Slater with Clive Churchill. And even though some people probably think I was around when Dally Messenger was playing, <laughs> I wasn't. Not in um, so I, I would never dare be unfair to try and compare the modern day player with, say, Dally Messenger or Frank Burge or one of the other immortals of the 13. Yeah. Rabs, you have been around a long, long time in terms of, you know, your career. Um, you're now retired. You went through the COVID period, still still employed, but you went through the COVID period. You're now retired. How are you dealing with retirement? How does it feel to be retired and not be at the forefront of the thing you loved? How do you feel? I, I'm, I'm getting on with it, yeah. I, I've got to get used to it. Um, I've been... Here's that word again. I've been an apprentice retiree uh, for quite some time and that probably helped me. The last few years that I worked, Channel 9, you'll never hear me bagging Channel 9 because they have been so good to me, it's not funny. Um, And they said to me, you don't need to do three days a week. Uh, Then they said, you don't need to do two days a week. And then they said in pretty much my final year, just do one when you feel like it. You know what I mean? Uh, I I will never forget that. And um, so you eased into into retirement. You I was I was I was semi retired three years before I retired. That's what I'm trying to say. Yeah, you're right, Mark. Um, so it, it hasn't been all that difficult because I I haven't come off a nine till five job. Uh, I've come off, in fact, doing one day a week, maybe one day every fortnight. And that eased me into retirement, and I'm I'm still getting used to it. Uh, the wife and I give the the restaurants a bit of a bashing, um, um, but other than that, I I sit and I watch the TV, and I I still get that feeling that I could I could have gone on. I mean, uh, people say to me, "Why don't you do number one hundred? And I deep down, I think I could. We're going to see an Alfie Langer moment with um, Wayne. Bringing... What you, 2001 when he brought him back from well, England. Do you think, um, do you think Sneezy <laughs> no. is going to give you a call and say, listen, we're going to need you back for call one more? Yeah, no, I, that, that's not going to happen. But I, the funny thing is say, you know, you talk about that. Origin's probably an easier game to call than uh, a lot of other games. I mean, I, I would struggle with a, with a lot of the Cowboys today. Um but, but Origin, everybody should be able to call Origin because they, they're nearly all household names. Um, so I, I wouldn't think it would be that difficult to do it. Does that six-year-old and nine-year-old kid who used to be sitting around with a dream to be a caller of sports, whether it's racing, swimming or football or whatever it is, does he still live inside you? Is he still there? Yeah, I, I think so. Yeah, I in in quieter moments, I might I might sit there and start calling it myself a little bit. You know, um, I can imagine this. Hmm? I yeah. can imagine it. There, there there wouldn't be anybody in the room, by the way, because they'd think I'd gone stark raving mad. But yeah, I, I the funny funny thing about it, I finished my career basically finished during COVID, and I'd never called off the television uh, like like. Uh, the others had been going to the studios to call it for quite some time, but suddenly I'm in a corner. It was it was the biggest fear I had. I hope they I hope they'd ask me to call it off off the tube, and I had to. 
through 19, uh, th- through 2021, I called three origins and, and the grand final all from the studio. And remember what I said about the crowd? Uh, well, <laughs> I couldn't hear the crowd. Um, so that made it a bit difficult for me. But, um, yeah, I I sometimes sit there and call a few a few runs, yeah. I can imagine that. And, and Rabs, how would... How would you describe success? What's success to you? You know, sitting back today, eight years of age, looking back on your life, looking about where you came from, who who your parents were, who your kids are today, who your friends are, the things you've achieved. How how would you measure success? Oh, no, I, 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 I don't know whether I can answer that. I mean, uh, I, I think... I think my friends, my friends and the people that I mix with, uh, they're the ones to judge how successful you were. I mean, I've had some lovely tributes paid to me, like the Hall of Fame of Rugby League. I I think I was the first uh, member of the media, broadcast media, to be um, inducted into the Hall of Fame. That- member 113. I think you're member 113. That's, That's exactly right. Yeah. Yeah, you're good at Got a good memory, <laughs> um, and uh, of course the, um, the the Hall of Fame that was a great thrill for me. And there are many other. Well, there's a statue too, by the way. There, there's a statue. Um, Let's talk about that. Do you want to talk about yeah, that? Yeah, I want to talk about the statue because well, I just recall you weren't happy with it originally. No, I wasn't happy. I well, wasn't tell happy. me about it. Well, the the guys on Two uh, GB, the continuous call, um, headed up by Hadley. Um, they, for some reason, were suggesting to various uh, uh, politicians, uh, mayors of whatever country, uh, country town, there should be a statue of Rebs in Juni. So it it starts, and it starts to get legs, and I am embarrassed because there must have been a lot of people from Juni that should have been on the list in front of me. Um, and it got to the point that I drove to Juni, um, listening of a sad day to, to the late Bozo and Hadley and Blocker and Broman and those people. They kept agitating and I got more agitated. So I drove to Juni and I said to the council, you can't do this. They said, settle back. We can't do it because we haven't got enough money to do it. So I came back. <laughs> I came back from Juni and I thought I've got that settled, you know, because I, I, it was embarrassing uh, to think that there would be a statue here uh, when I can name some wonderful heroes from Juni, but I haven't got the time. I rang uh, Hadley himself and I said, I got you. He said, what are you done? I said, they can't afford it. I said, there'll be no statue. And I'm sort of half laughing. And um, a day went by and he rang me back. He said, I got you back. I said, what are you talking about? He said, I rang Ginjal last night. He's going to underwrite the, the statue, so it is going ahead. Oh, I thought, oh, this is, this is not happening. But it happened. And to be honest with you, I'm proud of it. Yeah, I'm proud of it. You should and be. I, I thank, I thank Junie for letting it happen. Yeah. And also... You, yeah, well, Juni is responsible for who you are and if Juni wants to put up a statue of Ray themselves to honour what they did for you, that's just as – that's pretty bloody good, mate. That's a, that's a big deal. Like, if, Yeah, they, they kept my feet on the ground, you know. Totally. I, I, let me put it this way. You, if you, you wouldn't grow a big head at Juni because they'd soon take it off you. As my mother used to say – if you've got tickets on you, make sure you don't stand the wind because they're going to blow off. And exactly mind, right. Just yeah. make sure you got, think you've got tickets on yourself. Be careful. That's that's what I was thinking of, yeah. You didn't didn't walk around with tickets on yourself. Um, no. Because well, that, they, wouldn't, they wouldn't let you do that. But no, I, I think that's pretty good stuff, level-headed stuff. You've got OAM uh, uh, as well. You got uh, Yeah, I, I left that out of that list and I didn't didn't mean to leave it out and then God love them, um, Venues New South Wales chose to Name the broadcast centre at, at Arleons after after me, and I 
I'm so proud of all that. You asked me about probably half an hour ago, how do you, how do you measure success? Uh, maybe all of those tributes tells me that you were successful and you did live your dream, yeah. So if you but get, I, I'm more I'm more worried about what Joe Public thinks when 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 I'm gone. I, I whether he thinks I was successful, I don't know. Well, let me just maybe conclude. Mm-hmm. The great thing about being an interviewer is you get the last say. I think now, not when you're gone, but now, you know, hopefully when you're gone is a long way away, Rabs. I think the measure of success is you probably don't want to say it, you maybe don't even know it, is that Rabs is well loved in racing, swimming, and particularly rugby league community. Well loved by everybody I ever talked to. I was talking to a copy yesterday who I had to do something for New South Wales Police yesterday, a charity thing, and I said, you wouldn't believe who I'm interviewing tomorrow. And he said, you're serious. Said, I'm definitely listening to that. And he's just a random guy, like it's not a rugby league guy. Everybody I talk to says that about you. So maybe one measure of success is the legacy of love that you leave. Everyone loves Ray Warren. Gingell, our good mate, happy to contribute. Channel 9, you're an icon on the joint. So, mate, that's why I said right at the very beginning I was nervous because it's very rare that I get to sit in front of someone that – I think has such a massive legacy in things that I love in Australia that represent Australia and represent my life. It's very rare I get to see, see someone that holds I hold in such high esteem and get the opportunity to interview. And so I would say to you, thanks very much for coming in. Um, you didn't need to. I appreciate coming in. Thanks for sharing some stories about your past and thanks for everything you've done for us in the rugby league community in Australia, mate. Thank you. It's been um, been a pleasure. Um, and if you were nervous, you weren't as nervous as I was. <laughs> Good on you, Rabbis. Done.